Hey, by the way, we're recording. Okay. I'm ready. All right, welcome again to Anchor Bible School. We're glad you're here. Has it been a blessing? Yes. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear that hearty amen. It's very encouraging. It makes it all worthwhile. Uh, we are going to look now at the document that is titled A Providential Election. You should have that in your materials. A Providential Election. And basically, we are going to uh, study about the election of the successor of Judas. And there's a lot of important principles involved there that we're going to bring to view, uh, like the importance of biblical numbers, the importance of sola scriptura, the importance of finding Jesus Christ in prophecy. All of those will be illustrated uh, in this particular presentation. We're going to follow the material quite closely. You have it before you. That's my PowerPoint. See, this is much better PowerPoint than projecting it on the wall because you can't take the wall home. <laughs> but you can take this written material home. Uh, and in the future, what we'll do is we'll probably do this electronically to save a lot of trees uh, because uh, you know, several of you mentioned that you would like to have this in electronic form. And if you would like to, uh, please make sure that you give Eileen uh, your email address and we'll make sure that you get it in an electronic form so that you can use it for preaching and speaking. I hope that you'll share these things. Amen. You go back to your churches and you share this stuff. And uh, other people can get excited about studying the Bible and studying Bible prophecy. That's what it's all about. Not only for us. You know, a television audience is going to be watching this series. But, you know, it can go a lot farther than that if you go home and you share what you've learned here and inspire other people. The sanctuary begins in the camp where sinners live. Jesus came and camped with us and lived a life without sin in our place. In this way, he wove a spotless robe of righteousness by his perfect life in the camp. So Jesus wove the robe of righteousness by his obedience. The law demands absolute sinlessness. And we cannot offer this to the law. So Jesus came to live in our midst, a perfect life in our place. So his work begins in the camp by his perfect life that can stand in place of our life. Then we find the work of Jesus in the court. The law demands our death because the wages of sin is death. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the court of the sanctuary, Jesus suffered the death that we should all suffer. So on earth Jesus lived for us and died for us. Lived in our place and died in our place. Those are the benefits of his atonement. And then Jesus resurrected at the labor. We've already mentioned that. And when did that happen? That happened on very early on the first day of the week. So he lived in the camp for three and a half years, actually longer than that, his whole lifetime, but his ministry lasted three and a half years. Uh, Jesus performed the work of the court in the uh, court, in the, how would I say, on Thursday in the garden and on Friday on the cross. And I might make a little parenthesis here. Um, somebody was asking about uh, the three days and three nights. Um, you know, most people think that the three days and three nights begin from the time that Jesus was buried. And the chronology doesn't work. Even the inclusive reckoning does not work. Because three days and three nights, if you believe that it's from the time that he was put in the grave, you only have, um, actually you only have a Friday night and you have Saturday night. And as far as days, you have Friday, Sabbath, and Sunday as days. You only have three days and two nights. So you have to include Thursday night, because that's when the passion of Jesus begins. You see, the expression in the heart of the earth is a symbolic expression. The heart of the earth is the furthest place from God that you could go. Jesus did not literally go to the heart of the earth. He was buried above the earth, 
in a cave. So it's a symbolic expression that means the furthest and darkest place that you can be away from God. The darkest place would certainly be the center of the earth, or the heart of the earth, and the furthest place from God as well. Now in the sanctuary service, the lamb was alive while the sins were placed upon him. True or false? True. The lamb was brought alive, the sins were placed upon his head, then he was slain for sin. In the same way Jesus in Gethsemane, the sins were placed upon him while he was alive. Read the chapter Gethsemane in Desire of Ages. He could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. He felt that separation from God was going to be eternal. Ellen White several times says that he was drinking the cup of the wrath of God. He felt separation from his father. That happened while he was alive in the garden. And then the next day he went to the cross and he died like the lamb died. Are you with me or not? Yes. So the three days and three nights include Thursday night, which is when the sins of the world were placed upon him. In fact, Ellen White says that when he left the garden, he was at peace. The struggle was basically over when he left the garden of Gethsemane. Okay, back to the material. That was just a little extra. That's a bonus. <laughs> So Jesus resurrected on Sunday morning, and then after Jesus resurrected, He spent 40 days on planet earth. Now have you ever wondered why Jesus spent 40 days on planet earth between His resurrection and His ascension? Two reasons. They're given in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. I'm not going to read the verse, but basically it says that first of all, Jesus needed to appear to different groups of people to give indubitable proofs that He had resurrected. In other words, it was proof that He had resurrected by the post-resurrection appearances. But secondly, He stayed here because He had to teach His disciples the things concerning the Kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus had to explain to His disciples the prophecies that had been fulfilled in Him. And he had to explain to them the prophecies that would be fulfilled just a few days later on the day of Pentecost. He had to explain prophecy to them. He talked to them about the things concerning the kingdom of God. And then Jesus ascended to heaven. John 14 verses 1 to 3 tells us why Jesus left. It says there, Jesus is speaking, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so Jesus went to heaven. What did he go to heaven for? To prepare a place for us. How does Jesus prepare a place for us in heaven? He prepares a place in heaven for us by His work in the heavenly sanctuary. Just read the book of Hebrews. There you have a full description of what Jesus does in heaven. Read the sanctuary scenes in the book of Revelation. It tells us what Jesus went to heaven to do. He prepares a place by His work in the holy and most holy places of the heavenly sanctuary. And then, when the 40 days ended, Jesus ascended. Let's read about it in our material in Acts 1 and verses 9 through 11. It says there, Now when He had spoken these things, while they watched, He was taken up, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand up gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so now Jesus leaves, he goes to heaven to prepare a place for his people. Now after the ascension, the apostles returned to the upper room from the Mount of Olives and waited for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. During those ten days, we know that the disciples prayed, they studied the prophecies, 
they ironed out their differences, they emptied themselves of self, and in this way they prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. We know what the disciples were doing in the upper room. But the big question is, what was Jesus doing during those ten days? We know what the disciples were doing, but what was happening with Jesus during those ten days? This is the central theme of the study that we're doing right now. Now let's take a look at who was present in the upper room. The names are given in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. Let's read that verse to see who was present. They're mentioned by name. And when they had entered, that is when they came back from the Mount of Olives, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. And now I'm going to enumerate them. Number one, Peter. Number two, James. Number three, John. Number four, Andrew. Number five, Philip. Number six, Thomas. Number seven, Bartholomew. Number eight, Matthew. Number nine, James the son of Alphaeus. Number ten, Simon the zealot. And number eleven, Judas the son of James. What strikes you as strange about this list? There are only 11 apostles. And so Peter feels that it is necessary to stand up and explain what happened with the missing disciple. Because there were individuals present there besides the 12. Actually Mary the mother of Jesus was there and there were others present there that perhaps didn't know what had happened to Judas. And so Peter now stands in the upper room and he's going to explain what happened to apostle number 12. And that's found in verses 18 and 19. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and, his, and all his entrails gushed out. Very vivid description. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Now, as I mentioned, this might appear to contradict the account in the Gospels, where it says that Judas went and he committed suicide, he hung himself. I want to read the explanation that is given by Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 722, where she reconciles beautifully the story that is found in the Gospels and the story that is found in the book of Acts. She says this, Later that same day, on the road from Pilate's Hall to Calvary, there came an interruption to the shouts and jeers of the wicked throng who were leading Jesus to the place of crucifixion. As they passed a retired spot, they saw at the foot of a lifeless tree the body of Judas. It was a most revolting sight. His weight had broken the cord by which he had hanged himself to the tree. In falling, his body had been horribly mangled, and dogs were now devouring it. And so he fell headlong, his stomach burst open, and his entrails came out. And elsewhere Ellen White says that uh, Judas was the largest of the apostles, physically speaking. He, he stood above all of the disciples, and of course they thought that he would be a great asset to the church, even till the very end they thought he would be an asset to the church. Now after Peter explained what had happened to apostle number 12, he now says we need to elect a successor for Judas. We need to elect apostle number 12. And you know I always wondered why they felt it was necessary to, to uh, elect apostle number 12 and why it had to happen before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Those were questions that I asked of the passage. You know, it would have been beautiful to start in Acts chapter 2, you know, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then having the Holy Spirit, now you have the story of how they elect the successor of Judas, because now they have divine wisdom to have the Holy Spirit. So I said, but why did they elect the successor before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Why was there an urgency to elect the successor? Well, 
I discovered by reading the passage carefully that the reason why they felt they needed to elect a successor was because Bible prophecy required it. Bible prophecy required that a successor be elected. You see, there were two prophecies in the Old Testament that made it absolutely imperative to elect a successor for Judas. Those two prophecies are mentioned by Peter in Acts chapter 1 and verses 16 and 20. Acts chapter 1 verses 16 and 20. And we're going to skip verses 17 through 19 because that is where Peter described what happened to the apostle that was missing. And so verse 16 says, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. So there was a prophecy spoken by David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And now let's go to verse 20 because it mentions the two prophecies. One, uh, both of them are from David. Verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. In other words, Judas was not going to return to his home. His house would be left desolate. And that's Psalm 69 and verse 25. And then Peter quotes Psalm 109, verses 7 and 8, when he said, And let another take his office. So you see very clearly, prophecy predicted that Judas would not return to his home, his house would be desolate, and prophecy predicted that it was necessary to elect a successor. I wonder, how did Peter know that these prophecies applied specifically to this situation? Jesus spent what? Jesus spent 40 days teaching his disciples about the things concerning the kingdom of God. Jesus had explained to the apostles the meaning of these specific prophecies from the book of Psalms. Now, sometimes in the Adventist church we develop these myths that are passed on from generation to generation as gospel truth. I'm not talking about the large doctrines of the church. I'm talking about some smaller things, uh, smaller details, like, uh, you know, uh, the one that I mentioned yesterday from Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, where it says, uh, knowledge shall be increased, and, and other minor things. Uh, and one of those myths that is passed along is that it was God's intention that Saul of Tarsus be apostle number 12. But that the disciples jumped the gun. In other words, the disciples were so anxious to elect the successor that they elected the wrong individual. That if they had waited a while, God would have shown that he wanted Saul of Tarsus to be apostle number 12. Well, folks, this is an unfounded myth. And it has no biblical foundation. I made up my mind a few years ago that I am not going to simply repeat what is said or what I read. I'm going to go to scripture and I'm going to study it out for myself to see if it is so. Because even within the church we pass on sometimes these traditions as gospel truth and really they have no basis in scripture or even in the spirit of prophecy. Now there are four reasons that I want to share at this moment why Paul could not have been apostle number 12. And towards the end of our study, I'm going to give you an additional reason, a reason number five. Reason number one is found in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Very clearly, the qualifications of the successor are given. It says there in Acts 1, verses 21 and 22, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Question, uh, would the Apostle Paul fit in with this qualification? Absolutely not. The successor had to be with the Apostles 
from the time of the baptism of, the, of John the Baptist until the ascension of Jesus Christ. Saul of Tarsus was converted three and a half years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Saul or Paul is disqualified by this one point. There's a second point, and it's found in Acts chapter 1 verses 24 to 26. Acts 1, 24 to 26. Did the, did the apostles follow the correct procedure in electing the successor? Yes, they did. It says there in verse 24, And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. What are they praying? Lord, show us whom you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So did they follow the right procedure? Yes, they did. Did they ask the Lord that he should show which the successor should be? Absolutely. Now let's notice reason number three. Ellen White has this comment in the book Spirit of Prophecy, volume 3, page 264. Very clearly this statement indicates that they followed the right process and that the apostle that was chosen was God's choice. It says two men were selected who, in the careful judgment of the believers, were best qualified for the place. But the disciples, distrusting their ability to decide, the question further, referred it to one that knew all hearts. They sought the Lord in prayer to ascertain which of the two men was more suitable for the important position of trust as an apostle of Christ. Now listen carefully. The Spirit of God selected Matthias for the office. Was it the apostles who selected? No. The Spirit of God selected the successor of Judas. First of all, Paul is disqualified because he does not fit the characteristic of being with the apostles from the times of John the Baptist until the ascension of Christ. Secondly, we're told that they prayed to the Lord for the Lord to show which he had chosen. Ellen White in the third place clearly says that the Holy Spirit made the choice and the disciples were careful, they used careful judgment and they distrusted their own ability to decide. There's a fourth reason. And the fourth reason is that Saul was not to take the place of Judas, he was to take the place of Stephen. Notice this statement from Acts of the Apostles, page 102. See, uh, you know, my name is Stephen Paul. Isn't that interesting? I have the name of the martyr and the martyrizer. <laughs> my parents wanted to be like the martyrizer after his conversion. <laughs> and, and, and I want you to notice, Ellen White is clear on this. A mightier than Satan had chosen Saul to take the place of the martyred Stephen to preach and suffer for his name and spread far and wide the tidings of salvation through his blood. So was it God's plan that Saul of Tarsus be the successor of Judas? Absolutely not. And the fifth reason is going to be the most definitive of all. But we still ask the question, why the urgency to elect the successor of Judas before the day of Pentecost? Why not wait until the Holy Spirit was poured out and maybe they had more discernment. Why did they even need to elect apostle number 12? Well, the answer is in the significance of the number 12. One of the principles that we're going to study later on when we deal with biblical symbols is that numbers in the Bible are extremely important. Numbers have symbolic value. The number 4 has symbolic value. The number 40, the number 3, we all know the number 666, the number 144,000. Numbers have important symbolic significance in Scripture, and we need to know what these numbers represent in the totality of Scripture. So the question is, why was it necessary to have 12 apostles? The reason is simple. We have to understand the importance and meaning of the symbolic number 12. 
Now let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Uh, let me ask you, how do you suppose I found this verse that we're going to now? Sola Scriptura. You look up the number 12 in the concordance, and then you see if they're dealing with the same themes. And if they're dealing with the same themes, you can connect the verses. Are you with me? Now, you're not going to connect two verses that don't have anything to do with each other. They have to deal with the same subject in order to be able to connect them. Now, the number 12 is very important. Because you will notice that in Acts chapter 1, it says that Judas was numbered with the apostles. And then when Matthias was elected, it says that he was numbered with the apostles. So is the number significant? The number is extremely significant. There's something special about the number 12. And let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 to find out what the number 12 means symbolically. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars, or a crown of twelve stars. Now what does a woman represent? The woman represents the church. That I'll give you half credit for that. Because the woman represents the church, but it really represents the faithful church. It represents the faithful church. Now, how do we know that the woman represents the saints or the faithful church? Usually what we do is we use, say, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 where it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And we say, well, see, uh, the, as the husband, the relationship between the husband and the wife is illustrative of the relationship between Christ and his church. Christ the husband, the church the, the wife, just like you have the literal husband and his literal wife. And so we say, see here, the woman represents the church. But we don't really need to go outside of Daniel and Revelation to discover what the woman represents. Let's compare two verses. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and then let's go to Revelation 12, verse 14. Daniel 7, 25, and Revelation 12, verse 14. 7, 25 is speaking of the little horn, which represents what power? Represents the Roman Catholic papacy. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Remember that expression, he shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law, and then it tells us how long the saints will be under his power. The saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So what I want you to remember is you have a little horn, the little horn persecutes the saints of the Most High, and he does it for time, times, and the dividing of time. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 12 uh, and verse 14. And we'll read verses, I think it's 13 and 14. Revelation chapter 12. Notice it says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. Hmm. Who did the little horn persecute? The saints. So who does the dragon persecute? The woman. So who's the woman? The saints. You say, but how do you know this is the same time period? Well, let's continue reading. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Same time period as Daniel 7.25? Yes, but if you noticed, in Daniel 7.25, it is the little horn that persecutes the saints. In Revelation 12, it is the dragon that persecutes the woman. So the woman is equal to the saints. And incidentally, when you connect the two, there's a very important truth, and that is that the little horn is the emissary of the dragon. It is really the dragon who is persecuting the saints. Because Daniel 7 speaks of the earthly power, Revelation 12 speaks of the power behind the earthly power. Are you following me or not? Yes. Now, so, do Daniel and Revelation interpret what is meant by the woman? Yeah, the woman are the saints of the Most High. The woman represents Christ's faithful church. But now the question comes up, in Revelation 12 verse 1, this woman who has a crown of 12 stars, when John sees her in Revelation 12 verse 1, is this the Old Testament church or is this the New Testament church? 
It's the Old Testament church. When John sees her in Revelation 12 verse 1, I'm not talking about later in the chapter, but in Revelation 12 verse 1, it represents the Old Testament church because the child hasn't been born yet. You can't have a New Testament church before the child is born because the child is Jesus. Are you with me or not? And so you have the Old Testament church who is crying out in anguish because she wants the deliverer to be born. The Old Testament church longing for the coming of the Messiah. And then of course later on the woman represents the New Testament church. By the way it's just an extension of the same church because it's the same woman, right? And because she flees to the wilderness for 1,260 years, which means that uh, that's after the child is born, and so the woman represents both the Old Testament church and the New Testament church. Now, what is represented by the fact that this woman has 12 stars on her crown? Does she have 12 stars on her crown during the Old Testament period? Before the child is born? Yes. Does she still have the crown with 12 stars after the child is born? Yes, so she has 12 stars before and after. Now the question is, what is represented by the 12 stars? Well, let's see what it represents. Go with me to Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10. We're going forward a little bit in the material. Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10, the top of the next page. Uh, this is a dream that Joseph had. Remember that Joseph uh, was a dreamer? Uh, Joseph had a dream, and in that dream... Uh, he saw sun, moon, and stars. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> That's what you find in Revelation 12, verse 1. See, you have, to go, you have to apply the sola scriptura principle. So it says there in Genesis 37, verse 9, Then he, that is Joseph, dreamed still another dream, and told it to his brothers, and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. You say, it doesn't say 12 stars there, it says 11 stars. Let me ask you, who was star number 12? Joseph. Joseph. So what do the 12 stars represent? They represent the sons of Jacob. So let's finish reading. It becomes clear in verse 10. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And so the twelve stars represent the twelve sons of Jacob, but the interesting thing is that the twelve sons of Jacob then multiplied and became a great nation, the twelve tribes. Let's read Genesis 49 and verse 28. Genesis 49 and verse 28. Here you have the twelve founders multiplying into a great nation. It says there in Genesis 49, 28, and incidentally the context of this is that Jacob has called all of his sons before him, he's about to die, and he's going to give the characteristics of each of his sons, the character manifestation of each of his sons in the future. And, uh, and I want you to notice that after mentioning all of his twelve sons and their characteristics, we have this summary statement. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is what their father spoke to them, and he blessed them, and he blessed each one according to his own blessing. And so, the twelve stars, with regards to the Old Testament church, represent the twelve founders of God's godly nation in the Old Testament. Twelve individuals that then multiply and become a great nation. Now let's go to the New Testament. How many apostles did Jesus appoint? Jesus appointed 12 apostles. Notice I didn't say he chose 12 apostles, because Judas offered his services. But Jesus appointed 12. Why would Jesus appoint 12? Do you think Jesus said, now let me think, uh, what number can I choose? Seven? Perfection? No, no, I don't like that one. Uh, four? Universality? No. Um, definitely not six. Um, three for the Godhead? I think I'll choose twelve. Is that the way that he decided? No, no, no. He's purposely choosing twelve because they are going to be the founders of the New Testament church. Go with me to Mark chapter 3 verses 14 through 19. Mark chapter 3 verses 14 through 19. Very important. It says here, 
Then he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out demons. And then notice, they're listed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. They must have had a violent temper. Um, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. How many apostles? Twelve. Did the twelve apostles become the foundations of the Christian church? Did they go out and preach and then multiply and become a great nation? Twelve spiritual tribes, so to speak? Because we're dealing with spiritual Israel now. Twelve spiritual tribes. Now, multiply from the twelve individual founders. Now you say, Pastor Bohr, are you on the right track here? Well, let's see what the prophet had to say. Go with me to Acts of the Apostles, page 19. Listen carefully. As in the Old Testament, the twelve patriarchs stood as representatives of Israel, so the twelve apostles stood as representatives of what? Representatives of the gospel church. See, there it is clear. So what is represented by the number twelve? The number twelve is the number of God's people. It's the number of God's church. Twelve individual founders, twelve persons, then multiply and become the Old Testament church, a great nation, and then the twelve founders in the New Testament multiply through their preaching and they form a large nation or New Testament church, which is a continuation of God's plan for the Old Testament church. So the number twelve is the number that is used in connection with the church. There had to be 12 because the number 12 is the number of God's church. If there were 12 founders in the Old Testament, there had to be 12 founders in the New because the New Testament church is a continuation of the legacy of the Old Testament church. Now you'll notice, this is at the top of the next page where it says only one woman. It is important to remember that there is only one woman before Jesus was born, right? When Jesus was born, when the church was persecuted for 1260 years, and when the final remnant is persecuted, is it only one woman during all those stages? Yes. yes. God has only one true church. He does not have two separable peoples with two different plans. That's contrary to Daniel and Revelation. There is no such thing as one plan for literal Israel and another for the Christian church. They form an indivisible unity. Dispensationalists are totally wrong when they say that God has two mutually separable peoples, literal Israel and the Christian church. Revelation 12 tells us that there is only one Messiah and there is only one people of the Messiah and there is only one dragon who is active in all of the stages against the Messiah and the people of the Messiah. But now we need to ask the question, we know now why it had to be 12. You understand why? the significance of this symbolic number? But now we need to return to our original question. Why before the day of Pentecost? Okay, we, they needed to have 12, fine. That's all right, but why did they need to elect the successor before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? The answer is found in what was taking place with Jesus in heaven during the ten days that the disciples were in the upper room. Now we're going to take a peek into the heavenly throne room, and we're going to find out that something was happening during those ten days with Jesus. You say, what was happening during those ten days? Well. We need to go to Leviticus chapter 8, Leviticus chapter 8 and verses 6 through 12. Three things happened, and I want you to notice what the three things that took place, uh, I want you to notice the three things that took place here uh, in Leviticus chapter 8 verses 6 through 12. Now Leviticus 8 has the type, it has the Old Testament scenario, the Old Testament picture that is fulfilled during those ten days by Jesus. In other words, we're going to study now the type or the shadow 
but if we understand the shadow we're going to understand what it represents in the future on a broader and larger scale. What happened in the little tent in the wilderness is going to happen on, with the heavenly sanctuary which is huge. You know the, the earthly sanctuary was made to scale. We don't know how large the heavenly sanctuary is. It's huge. It fits millions and millions of angels. So it has to be a huge place. But we have the small scale model that we're going to look at now and then we are going to look at what it represents symbolically. So let's go to Leviticus 8 verses 6 through 12. Then Moses, this is before the sanctuary in the wilderness began its services. This is before the inauguration. This is the inauguration service. It says, Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And now he's going to do something very interesting with, with Aaron. And he put the tunic on him girded him with the sash, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. And he girded him with the intricately woven band of the ephod, and with it tied the ephod on him. Then he put the breastplate on him, and he put the urim and the thummim in the breastplate, and he put the turban on his head, also on the turban on its front, he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Also Moses took the anointing oil. Now notice that the second function that's going to take place here, right? What was the first function? Moses clothed as the what? The high priest. The first task before the sanctuary service could, could begin, in the tent, Aaron had to be clothed as the high priest. But then something else happens, verse 10. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it, and consecrated them. Did he anoint the entire tabernacle? Yes, why? It had to be set apart because Aaron was going to serve in there. Not only did Aaron have to be set apart, the sanctuary had to be sanctified or set apart. And so it says in verse 11, he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, anointed the altar and all its utensils and the labor and its base to consecrate them. And now notice the third function. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Three things. Number one, clothe the high priest. Number two, anoint the sanctuary where the high priest was going to serve. And number three, anoint the high priest with oil. Now you say, what does this symbolize? Well, let's go to Psalm 133. It's a very short psalm. Psalm 133. And let's notice something very interesting here. This is what I call a Pentecostal psalm. Not because it belongs to the Pentecostals, but, it gets, but because it has to do with Pentecost. And immediately you're going to see. When we read the first verse, you, another verse is going to come to mind immediately. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. What verse comes to mind? Is there any verse that comes to mind? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord. Brethren meeting together or dwelling together in what? In unity. Now notice verse 2. It is like the precious oil upon the head. And I want you to notice this is not just a little trickling of oil like we, when we anoint sick people. <laughs> the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron. Ah, now we know that this is reminiscent of Leviticus 8, don't we? The beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. Wow, this is a lot of oil to have it run down, to run down your face, down your beard, onto your garments, even to the bottom of the border of the garments. This is an abundance of oil. And so it says running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments, and it all not only runs down onto the edge of his garments, but it says it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Let me ask you, who was gathered on the mountains of Zion? The twelve apostles in the upper room. And so you have this picture 
of the oil being poured on the head, going down the beard, going down to the border of the garments, and it's so abundant that some of the trickle falls on the mountains of Zion where the apostles are gathered together in unity. What am I saying, folks? What I'm simply saying is that the Holy Spirit that fell on earth was just a little trickling of the gift that Jesus had received from His Father in heaven. During those ten days, God the Father was clothing Jesus as the high priest. Piece by piece, God the Father clothed Jesus as the high priest to serve as the high priest of His people. Not only was Jesus clothed, but then the sanctuary was set apart or was sanctified because that is where Jesus was going to serve as the high priest. And then Jesus received from His Father, you can read it in Acts 2 verse 33, He received the promise of the Spirit of His Father and it was so abundant that it dripped down up into the upper room where the disciples were gathered together on the day of Pentecost. So where was the significant event? The significant event was not on earth at all. The earthly event was an announcement that Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus had been accepted by the Father. He had presented himself before his Father and he said, Father, is my sacrifice sufficient? Jesus says, yes, it is sufficient. And so now the Holy Spirit, the Father gives Jesus the promise of the Holy Spirit to pour out upon His disciples so that they would have the power to proclaim what Jesus had done and what He was willing to do for each individual that comes to Him in faith. Wow! So is Jesus the high priest? Yes. Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 and 2. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. You see, that little tabernacle in the wilderness was only a little scale model of what Jesus went to do in heaven in the holy place. Of course, we still haven't answered the question, why did they have to elect a successor before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Now we're ready for the answer. And we're going to have reason number five, why it could not be Saul of Tarsus. One of the pieces of clothing that the high priest wore, and which undoubtedly Jesus wears in heaven because he is clothed as the high priest, was what is called the breastplate. Now let's read in Exodus chapter 28, verses 21, and then we'll jump to 29 and 30, verses 29 and 30, about the breastplate. It covered the heart of the high priest. It says there in Exodus 28, verse 21, And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel. So what did the stones have, the twelve stones? They had the names of the sons of Israel, the founders of the Old Testament church. Twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the twelve tribes. Do you notice that, go, that it goes from the names of individuals to the tribes? In other words, in the individuals is represented the entire people. And then notice verses, verses 29 and 30. So Aaron, listen to this, so Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment. Notice it's called the breastplate of judgment. That's significant. Over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So, now here comes an important point, so Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. What does Aaron bear in his heart? The judgment of the children of Israel. Now what does that mean? It means, folks, that when we come to Jesus Christ and claim what Jesus did for us, we claim His life and His death as our own. The breastplate of judgment says, I bore the judgment that you deserve. 
Jesus bears the judgment of his people upon his heart. If anyone sins, we have what? An advocate with the Father. When we repent of our sins and we confess our sins and we come to Jesus, we say, Jesus, I'm sorry I did this and I recognize I'm a sinner and I confess my sin to you, but Jesus, you bore the punishment, you bore the judgment that I deserve. Please, Jesus, take your life and your death and place them to my account. Then Jesus, with his breastplate, says, I bear your judgment. What an amazing truth we find in the most holy place. Notice Isaiah 53 where we find this idea of Jesus bearing the judgment of his people. The very same word bear that is used here in Exodus 28. It says in Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5, a messianic prophecy. Surely he has what? Born. That's the same Hebrew word. He has born. Where did he bear it? On his heart. His heart exploded on the cross, did it not? When they, when they, when they uh, you know, pierced his side with a spear, blood and water came out because they pissed his heart. And so it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Did he bear our judgment? Yes or no? He sure did. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. He, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He bore our judgment. And when he comes before the Father, he says, Father, don't look at Pastor Bore, look at me, because I bore his judgment. Wow! No reason to be depressed. <laughs> We have to be happy people. No reason to feel guilt if we have come and met the conditions and we've come to Christ. We can have peace with God. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, as Adventists we say, well, you know, I have to wait until my name goes through, uh, goes through a process in the judgment. And we're always scared, you know, because our name might appear before the judgment. Well, we wouldn't be scared if we are in Christ. If we constantly, through the power of God, are repenting of sin and confessing our sin and recognizing our need of Christ, we wouldn't have any problems. And you know, there's some people who say, like Desmond Ford, they say, well, you know, believing that Christ takes the sins and puts them in the sanctuary, that takes away our security of salvation. Because, you know, they're taken from us and they're put in there. But let me tell you something, my greatest assurance of salvation is to have my, sa my sins in the sanctuary and going in there through the blood. Because if they're not there, they're here. Amen. So you better make sure you put them in there, covered with the blood of Jesus. Our greatest assurance is to have our sins in the sanctuary, covered by the blood of Jesus. Because if they're not there, they're here. Now, yeah. thank you, brother. I was wondering when you were going to warm up. <laughs> now, let's, let's finish this up. How many stones did the breastplate have? It had 12 stones, representing the 12, the 12 uh, sons of Jacob, but also the what? The 12 apostles. Remember the number 12 on the crown of the womb? The 12 apostles, from where a great nation grows. Now, how many apostles were there on earth when the disciples first met in the upper room? Eleven. Eleven. But Jesus was going to be clothed with what? Twelve. He was going to be clothed with the breastplate that had twelve stones. So the question is, how could Jesus be clothed with the breastplate that had twelve stones if there were only eleven apostles? It was necessary first to elect apostle number 12 and then Jesus could wear the breastplate with the 12 stones. There is a reason for everything in scripture. Every detail is important. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is a filler. You know, every little detail has some nuance connected with Jesus Christ. Is this Christ-centered what we've studied? It all revolves around folks. All of these prophecies of the Old Testament. Psalm 133. Leviticus chapter 8. 
they, they find their fulfillment and their beauty in Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, they are totally meaningless. Now one final point. This is the beautiful thing. The New Jerusalem is going to have people from the Old Testament church and from the New Testament church all together in one city. Like you have one woman, you have one city. You say, how do you know that? Go with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12. And then we'll read verse 14 as we close. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12. Speaking about the city, the new, the holy city, Jerusalem. It says, also, she had a great and high wall. And then what does it say? With twelve gates. And twelve angels at the gates. And names written on them. Which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So is the Old Testament church represented in the city? Absolutely. They're represented where? They're represented on the foundations of the walls. What about the New Testament church? Let's go to verse 14. Now. The wall of the city, by the way, previously was the gates, not the wall. But notice, Revelation 21, verse 14. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of what? Of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So the gates have the name of the tribes, and the foundations have the names of the apostles. So in one city... You have all of God's people represented. One city that gathers all of God's people from all ages. The Old Testament church and the New Testament church. God does not have one plan for Israel and another another plan for the church. He has had one plan and that one plan centers on Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it was Jesus Christ predicted, foreshadowed, announced beforehand through symbols, through ceremonies. In the New Testament, those ceremonies find their fulfillment and their meaning. And so do we have a message for the Jews today, particularly? They don't understand their own religion. They're still waiting for the Messiah. We have a message to say, folks, He's already here. He already came. Receive Him, and then you'll understand what your religion is all about. So the scriptures are centered in Jesus Christ. Not only the New Testament scriptures, but the Old Testament scriptures as well. What an incredible book the Holy Scripture is. May we enjoy studying it and living it in our lives. Okay, so this ends our morning sessions. This afternoon, let's see, it is... um, We almost ended on time.